thank you, Dr. Lang, for the introduction, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you today and share my 42 plus year career in the real estate world. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, good. My agenda today, I'm hoping it'll be interactive. I'm gonna ask you some questions and the second a question pops up into your mind, even if it's off topic, just raise your hand and um, I welcome your questions and I'll do the best I can to answer them. Uh, my agenda is I'm gonna to touch on my real estate journey, uh, talk about Contravest Development Partners, who I've been with now for 26 years, talk about their history, their platform, what we do, talk about the benefits of multifamily industry, uh, talk about t targeted apartment metrics and who invests in apartments. Uh, talk about the relationship between NOI and property values, which I'm sure you've had classes in. I'm going to share you some uh, case studies and real stories about economic downturn and how it impacts not only real estate companies, but properties that are in development or uh, under construction. I'm going to share some stories about some successful apartment developments that we've been involved with. And then I'm gonna prevent, uh, present a joint venture decision dilemma that a real, real, real time problem that happened to us about five, six years ago. And I'm gonna ask you guys what you would have done or what ideas you might have had given the same set of circumstances. So uh, I will kick off and talk about my career. I graduated from the University of Florida in 1976 with a four-year degree in accounting, and I had no idea whether I wanted to do public accounting, private accounting, audit, tax, what industry. I had no clue. I had no mentor uh, through my four-year uh, college career. I did no internships. I didn't have any family advisors helping to shape my direction, no guidance counselor. I, I, I graduated, got my degree, and then I woke up and I said, oh my God, I need to find a job. So when I compare my situation 42 plus years ago to the majority of you that are in the MSRE program, uh, you guys are head and shoulders uh, so much more prepared for understanding the career path that you hope to uh, participate in you hopefully have taken advantage of your mentor and the real estate, real estate advisory board members. Um, I forgot to mention, I've been an advisory board member, I think in my 13th year, and every year usually two, three, four students will come to our company, spend a half a day or a day learning about our company, and uh, I usually get to take them out and show them some of our projects that we're either building or have completed. Um, so anyway, so back to my, so my path. So graduated, s pulled out the newspaper, and just started to send my resume into a couple of uh, job opportunities. And the first interview I had, and the first job offer I had, was with a national real estate investment company that owned shopping centers, office buildings, and apartments all over the country. And I got hired, and this is going to knock your socks off, starting salary, $8,500 a year, which equates to about $4 an hour. It's a big time, so I, I, I hit the lottery right on the bat. <laughs> and um, so I did that for about a year and a half and just was doing accounting for real estate. And uh, a year and a half later, my boss leaves the company and goes to work for Prudential in their real estate investment office. And he gives me a call shortly thereafter and said, hey, real, Prudential is an awesome company to work for. I got a position in the accounting department, so I jumped ship and went to work for Prudential. By the way, I'm, gonna sh I'm sharing you some details of my career, which had so many twists and turns, as Dr. Ling mentioned, because I guarantee you the majority of you are going to have a lot of twists and turns as well. And even though as I went through my career, I, I didn't know how it was going to end up, Everything was like a perfect puzzle. Everything I did helped make me become a better professional and a real estate executive. So bear with me as I share this, all the twists and turns of my career. Um, so I then joined Prudential in the real estate investment office. Super cool environment, a ton of real estate professionals that had expertise in development, asset management, um, acquisitions, MAI appraisers, and all of a sudden I was 
having lunch and, and working with these guys every day and learning more about the real estate business. And I actually saw myself potentially becoming a lifelong Prudential employee. Uh, awesome company, great benefits, um, low stress, and it, and it was just a perfect environment for an accounting person. Well, a year and a half into my tenure at Prudential, I'm 25 years old, and I was involved in the sale of a 1,067 unit apartment community to a condo developer from Chicago, condo converter. And I got invited to the closing dinner. And 25 years old, all these executives from this Chicago condo converter company, all these senior people from Prudential, and a 25-year-old young accounting person who happened to be involved in the accounting transaction side of the closing. Super cool experience to be at a high-end restaurant with all these senior executive people and celebrating the sale of a 1,067-unit apartment community, which was a big asset for Prudential at the time. And celebrations, toast, and I'm sitting there pinching myself saying, this is super cool. I kind of fell into a great industry and real estate is a, I, I was blessed to have fallen into that. And, um, and I was hoping that I was going to have many more closing dinners in the future. So about a week and a half later, out of the blue, I get a phone call from the condo converter from Chicago who had met me at the closing dinner. He says, hey, you might not remember me. I met you at the dinner and we're looking to set up an office in South Florida and we're looking for financial analysts to do projections on condo conversion opportunities throughout the country. I was, had zero interest in looking for another job. I was totally happy at Prudential, and, but as a courtesy, I was flattered that he called me, and I said, sure, I'll come in for the interview. Going for the interview, went fine, left the interview, didn't think a second about it because I wasn't interested. A week or so later, the president of the condo converter called me and said, John, listen, we've interviewed a bunch of candidates. We think you're the right person for the job. What's it going to take to get you to come on board? He, I was totally caught off guard. And uh, so I said, listen, I appreciate that. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to think about it overnight, and I'll call you tomorrow. So I get home, talk to my wife, sit down at a, uh, at a table, and take out a piece of paper, and I did the pros and cons. Stay with Prudential, comfortable situation. I love the people I work with, stress-free, great company, wonderful benefits, could be a lifelong career. Or B, go to work for this entrepreneurial, high-risk, specialized uh, condo converter. Uh, I was intimidated by the chairman of this condo conversion company, extremely wealthy, big man. I just, I, I saw him at dinner and I was nervous. And uh, so, Never in a million years could I picture myself working for that company. So I did the pluses and minuses, and it was like 95% stay at Prudential, 5%. The only way I would ever go to work for this condo converter was if they were going to pay me a lot of money. So I had played a lot of poker in college, and I was pretty good at bluffing. So the next morning, I called the president, and I said, talked it over, and I'm willing to come on board if you're willing to pay me X and X was 75% more than what I was making. And I was 1,000% positive that there was no way he was gonna accept that offer. So I, I could tell by his reaction, he was shocked at my number, and he said, I'm gonna have to get back to you, I'm gonna have to talk to the chairman. So hung up, and I'm thinking, thank God, there's no way they're gonna offer me that. Calls me back the next day, and he says, John, I talked to the chairman, we've accepted your offer, when can you start? <laughs> and that, and I, I freaked out, and, but I had committed in my head that if, if they hit my number, I was going to go. So as I look back at my career path, it changed the total trajectory of my career. And if I had stayed at Prudential, which I really wanted to do, uh, who knows where I would have ended up. But going to work for this entrepreneurial company, I got to see the art of the deal. I got pulled into conference calls, meetings, strategy sessions when I'm 25, 26 years old. I got to see how they negotiated huge transactions, and I was like a sponge. Um, and I learned so much in a short amount of time, uh, 100 times more quickly than I would have if I had stayed at Prudential. So for six years, I did 
projections on condo conversion opportunities all over the country. I started traveling all over the country, getting involved in operations on these condo conversions. And I learned a tremendous amount, gained a lot of confidence. And um, at the end of six years, this was like eight, 1987, 86 or 87, condo conversion came to an abrupt halt. And somehow, the chairman got approval to become a real estate workout consultant for the RTC, the Resolution Trust Corp. Some of the, uh, uh, you, some of the professors here might, might know who they are. So the RTC was set up by the federal government to liquidate failed SNLs, savings and loans, all over the country. So all of a sudden, this condo converter gets hired to liquidate the assets of failed SNLs in Louisiana. And I find myself working in Louisiana for two straight years, commuting from Miami with my wife and two young daughters. And I started to learn all about the real estate workout business and, and uh, underwriting loans and figuring out what was the best strategy to maximize value for these uh, failed SNLs. So I did that for two years, learned a lot, but I hated the fact that I was away from my family. So I started looking for another job uh, and I found an opportunity in Orlando. I moved my family from Miami to Orlando and I got hired by a national real estate development company that developed apartments, office buildings, and single family projects. And I got hired as a portfolio manager managing 56 apartment communities from north of Tampa all the way down to Fort Myers and Naples and, and everywhere in between. So I was not an expert on apartments. I had to roll up my sleeves and figure out how apartments work, NOI, how to grow uh, rents, increase NOI, maximize the value of my portfolio of properties. And I did that for a year and a half. And one day I came into the corporate office in Orlando and found out that they just terminated free coffee for the entire company. And uh, news alert, uh, spoiler alert, when they terminate free coffee, usually something bad is about to happen. And sure enough, shortly thereafter, they filed bankruptcy. The Tax Reform Act of 1987 that professors might, might know about devastated uh, Cardinal Industries. They never recovered. And I found myself having to look for another job opportunity. So now it's like 1990, a horrible time to be looking for a job in real estate. Uh, a national recession was in play and nobody was hiring. And lo and behold, I get incredibly lucky. The FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, was setting up a brand new office in Orlando and was hiring 40 real estate workout loan officers to liquidate failed banks. And I get hired by the FDIC in the middle of a recession. It was a blessing. I had no idea that my two years worth of workout experience in Louisiana was gonna help me get a job later on. Had no idea. So they hired 40 real estate workout loan officers. 39 of them were bankers with real estate workout experience and I was the only non-banker that got hired. It was an awesome um, job. I got assigned a portfolio of about $100 million worth of loans that were either maturing in default or were already in foreclosure. And my job was to review each loan file to figure out the history get in touch with the borrower, and then discuss and negotiate whether uh, a, a settlement, a negotiated settlement might be in the works, whether we needed to restructure the debt and give them more time, or whether I needed to foreclose. So I would come up with what I thought was the best recommendation, and then I would get up in front of a committee, an executive committee of the FDIC, and I would have to sell my recommendation to the committee and then field questions. So it, it was, Super cool to put together a recommendation and then sell it in front of a committee. And it was just great experience um, trying to get the executive to approve your recommendation. So I did that for three years. I was very successful and I loved it. And um, I think I was more successful than all the other loan officers because I had been on the development side and I, I had compassion for these real estate developers and I was more successful in generating um, settlements and restructures than all the other bankers. So, and super cool experience. After three years, 
The FDIC was going to close down the Orlando office because we had liquidated the majority of the assets. And I had a choice to either relocate to Atlanta, which I didn't want to do. I had a wife and two young children. Or uh, look for a job. And I had, they gave me three months head, no, head notice that I had three months to find a job if I didn't want to relocate. So I start looking for my next opportunity. And I pull out the newspaper. This is in uh, 1993. Does anyone know what a blind ad is? Who doesn't, who doesn't know what a blind ad is? Because uh, of technology today. Blind ad, back in the day, at, at, you know, 26 years ago, companies would send um, an advertisement for a job opening to the newspaper. It wouldn't have the company name, wouldn't have the phone number, wouldn't have the address. It would just say what position was open. And you'd mail your resume into the newspaper, and then the newspaper would forward it to the appropriate company. So I see this advertisement, apartment developer looking for a CPA, CFO. I send my resume in. A week and a half later, I come home from the FDIC and my wife says, honey, you got a, uh, somebody called about a job interview. So I listen to the voicemail message and it says, hi, this is Jerry. Got your resume. Please give me a call. I want you to come in for an interview. My number is 407 4 and then my answering machine truncated the message. So I listened to it a second time, and sure enough, there was only four numbers. And I'm like, darn, I can't believe it. Terrible luck. So all of a sudden, a few minutes later, a little voice in my head said, John, do not give up that easily. So I took out the yellow pages. Does anyone know what the yellow pages are? OK, it's phone book. I go to real estate companies, and I start looking for every real estate company that had the first four digits of the phone number. And I started cold calling. Hi, does Jerry work there? No. Hi, does Jerry work there? On my 11th call, I found Jerry. I came in for the interview. Jerry was the founder of the company and the CEO. And sit down on the couch, and I tell him the story of the phone message getting truncated and, and the efforts I made. So he was impressed with my extra effort. We talked for two hours. We hit it off. It was like a match made in heaven. The chemistry, the, it was like I'd known him for 20 years. And um, the next day, I met his other partner. And a few days later, Jerry called me back in, sits me down, and says, John, we think you're the right candidate for, for our company. The only problem is we've just gone through a three-year recession, and um, cash is really tight. And I don't know how much you were making at the FDIC, but we can't pay you very much. But the future is bright. We're going to get back into apartment development. Um, and he offered me a number that was 35% less than what I was making at the FDIC. Normally, when you leave the government to go to private sector, you usually get a big raise. <laughs> so he offered me 35% less than what I was making. And I, my wife was a stay-at-home mom with two young kids. So now I had a huge decision to make. Do I say goodbye, thanks, but no thanks, and keep looking? Or do I take this opportunity? And my gut told me that even though the money was way off, the opportunity was what I was looking for. It was a small entrepreneurial company and that had done apartment developments, and they were about ready to gear up and do new ones. So I took the chance of a lifetime. I took a huge pay cut, and I joined ContraVest Development Partners. And four, four years later, the other co-founder of the company retired, and I got offered an opportunity to buy in um, a, a ownership interest for a lot of money. The buy-in amount was more than the mortgage on my house. So I had to then make a decision, do I want to pay all this money on the come, because uh, the company still was just starting to come back out of the recession, and um, I decided to pay the, this huge buy-in amount they allowed me to pay it over, turn, over like three or five years, and I became a partner, a small sliver of an interest. So I'm now in my 26th year, and it was the best decision I ever made in my life. It's, just, it's been an incredible ride. We, we've gone through a lot of ups and downs. But I want to share the twists and turns in my career to let you know that you may start in a company different than what you thought, doing something different, learn as much as you can, be a value add, volunteer to do more things. And when you least expect it, another door's gonna open and you're gonna 
jump ship and go somewhere else. And you may not understand where, how your journey is going to go, but hopefully uh, you'll be as lucky as I have been. And uh, you make a lot of your own breaks, but there's a lot of luck involved in life. And I'll be the first to admit that um, sometimes you can do everything right and not catch breaks. And uh, so anyway, uh, sorry, I hope I didn't bore you too much with the twists and turns of my career, but I thought it, w it might be helpful as you guys get ready to start your career path. And um, so that's, that's any questions on my history? I'm sorry, say that again? We're walking into a recession coming out of school. That's what I've been told a couple of times. So do you have any advice for how to handle that? <clears throat> uh, number one, if there is a recession coming, I think it's hopefully several years out at the earliest. Number two, I think it'll be a mild recession, God willing. I don't, I don't think we're going to see anything like we saw in 2008 to 11, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, but, you know, I'm sure most of you have a vision for the perfect job. And just be flexible, be open. You just want to get your foot in the door somewhere in a real estate company. And as I said, learn as much as you can. Volunteer, work late, come in early, and opportunities will present themselves and, and just, you know, go, go with the flow. And, um, but if, in fact, a recession hits when you're looking, all you can do is knock on doors and be willing to work for, you know, I, I may even be willing to work for, for no salary to get your foot in the door somewhere would be my advice or, you know, minimum wage or something just to get your foot in the door to show what, what your worth is. So, any, any other questions about my, my journey? Yes. Yeah, your success was measured by how much money you brought into the FDIC on your portfolio of assets. So I was able to negotiate a lot of settlements and get it approved through committee. Uh, so I, I brought in a lot of cash to the FDIC. And um, part of it, I think, was because I was compassionate. I a lot of these developers had been development business for 10, 20, 30 years, had built up, you know, substantial net worth, and then they got caught in a recession, and they lo a lot of them lost the majority of everything they'd worked for their whole career. And a lot of bankers maybe had a different attitude about, screw them, I'm just going to foreclose and, and get their, their collateral and go after them. I was more of the mindset, uh, I want to try to make it a win-win for both and get as much money as I can get for the FDIC and hopefully leave some dignity for the uh, developer. So. Any other questions on my career path? Okay. All right. And again, don't hesitate to raise your hand as I'm talking. Uh, interrupt me at any time. All right. Uh, Contravest Development Partners, who I've been with now in my 26th year, privately owned company that was founded in 1986. The, t the two original founders, one retired 21 years ago, the other one retired five years ago. So now it's myself and two other partners. They happen to be twins, and they're the sons of the CEO and the co-founder of the company. So for many years, I was working with the dad and his two twin sons. And talk about fam family dynamics, and I was the only non-family member. I could tell you a thousand stories about how unique that was. Um, so as Dr. Ling mentioned, we develop, build, and manage market rate luxury apartment communities. Uh, we do it for ourselves, uh, as development projects, as well as for third-party clients. Uh, we also manage for, uh, some for third-party clients, but that's not our main focus. Um, we've built about 23,000 units, uh, developed over 13,000 units, and the southeast U.S. has been our main footprint. Um, Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, but we've done three projects in Texas, three projects in Arizona, and one project in Colorado. But the last seven, eight years, we've been mainly focused on Central Florida, Tampa, St. Pete, and Orlando. But we have three, three new opportunities in North Carolina, Charlotte, Raleigh, and uh, we also have three new projects, uh, one in St. Pete, two in Orlando, that we hope to break ground this year. Um, 
we've had many joint venture partners, institutional, private partners, and, and I'll uh, share more details about that a little bit later. In the last 22 years, I think we've sold about 35 apartment communities, and our average uh, IRR for properties that we've developed, leased up, and sold has been close to 27%, and our equity multiple's been a little over two. Uh, anybody not know what an equity multiple is? If not, I'll, I'll be happy to explain. Well, in, case, in case you don't want to raise your hand, <laughs> equity multiple means if our partner invested 15 million, they got back 30 million when we exited. So um, we're, we're proud of our, our history. Uh, and our average hold period is about 4.3 years from the time we break ground to the time we sell. We're considered merchant developers. Uh, occasionally we have partners that want to hold long term, and we're fine with that. And sometimes um, if we're in the middle of a recession, which is the worst time to sell, uh, we will hold long term, put permanent financing. So we've done that a bunch of times uh, by necessity. A any questions on th that little slide? All right. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well. But anyway, as I mentioned, we're, we're what's considered vertically integrated. We have a development arm that obviously finds the site, figures out what we should build on it, how many units, um, what the mix should be, uh, secures the entitlements, hires the architect and engineer, and, and, and moves towards getting permits so we can break ground. We also have a general contracting arm, Contravest Builders, and we hire all the subcontractors, we manage all the subs, we manage the budget, and we manage the schedule. We don't do any of the work ourselves. It's all supervisory. And we also have a management company that we touched on, and s roughly 60 days. Oh, go ahead. Were you always vertically integrated, or was that? No. When I started with Contravest, we were a development company and a management company. And, and you just reminded me of a story. I was like six months with Contravest in 1993 or 94, and all of a sudden, the partners say, hey, I think we should just set up a, a, a general contracting company to start building our own projects. And I, as a conservative accountant background, I was freaked out by that because I knew construction was incredibly risky. Um, you know, if there's overruns, you have to eat it. And they, f they forced me to go get with our attorney to set up a, co a construction company entity, and then we started building projects with almost no experience. That was crazy 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 but it's worked out uh, we hired some good people and uh, you can make a lot of money in construction if you do it right you can lose your shirt if you if you don't do it right so having all three companies um, we think gives us an advantage we're vertically integrated a lot of development companies hire third-party builders third-party management companies some developers just have a management company. Some just have a construction company. We think it makes us a better developer because we can turn to our uh, construction department and get real-time historical cost numbers, current jobs that we're building, and we, it helps us develop a better pro forma for the construction cost number, which is the biggest part of a, a project. And having a management company in-house is huge. We can turn to our senior management folks and they can help validate a site that we're looking at. They can help with the mix. They can help with the pro forma rents, operating expenses. They can help with what amenities have worked that we should continue and what amenities we should eliminate. And so having that all in-house, we think is huge. Any questions on that? I, uh, a few projects that we built, a uh, project we finished in August of 2018 in Windermere, a beautiful section of Orlando, and our partner here wants to hold long term. A uh, project we built in St. Pete, our partner was Northwestern Mutual, and that's a long term hold as well. And it's a project we built, anybody live in Orlando? Oh, anyway, the Millennium Mall. Uh, is we're literally like a half a mile or a mile from the Millennium Mall. And um, we, in the first time in our history, when we got the final CO on the last building, we were already 95% pre-leased. And so pro residents were ready to move in the second the last CO was realized. And shortly thereafter, we sold it and knocked it out of the park. So that was uh, a beautiful 
successful project. And now I'm going to show you a little drone video of our, a little commercial on our company. It's about two minutes, so. I had nothing to do with that uh, drone presentation, but I thought it's pretty cool. So, um, all right, real estate developers, society, every person probably has a different perception or image of what real estate developers do, whether they're good for the economy, bad for the economy. Anybody brave enough to uh, give me their perception of a real estate developer, good or bad? Anybody want to raise their hand? Throw out a perception. The dark side. Anybody else? <laughs> Donald, Trump. Donald Trump. All right, well, this is what my friends think I do and what real estate developers do. Bob the Builder. This is what my mom thinks that we do and build. Taj Mahal. This is what society thinks we do. Destroy the environment. This is what architects think we build. <laughs> this is what developers think that we do. Orchestra leader coordinating 100 different musicians and moving parts, and, and that's very accurate. It's un unbelievable amount, the number of things that you have to get through before you have a successful development. But this is what we actually do as developers. It's like a big hockey fight. I mean, literally, to get through development is a nightmare. Entitlements, finding joint venture partners, finding lenders. And then when you build a project, the subcontractors are a nightmare, always behind schedule. I mean, there's a million problems that go wrong. And then when you finally have a completed property, residents are nightmares, always complaining. And so that's kind of what life is like as a development company. But I will say this, development, I, I, I don't take any deal for granted. Every deal is a miracle because there literally are. If one thing goes wrong in the development plan, the deal could crater. You may lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. And everything has to work right uh, for everything to line up to get a deal done. And then to sell a property, everything has to go right to, to execute and, and have a successful product. So um, it's, people think it's easy. It's not. It's a tough business. And I wish, you know, you've seen that commercial, there's an easy button. You just press the easy button. It, it's not like that at all. So we, we earn the fees that we earn, develop. We earn the fees to build, and we earn the fees that we ma manage. And there's a lot of headaches involved. And uh, I'm only 27 years old. My hair is gray from being in this business for a long time. All right, the benefits of multifamily real estate. Um, very stable asset class. Uh, 
properties generate cash flow income that gets distributed to the partners and oftentimes depreciation tax benefits shelter that cash flow and that income. So the partners get the cash in their pocket and the taxes are deferred. They don't have to pay income taxes until the property gets sold two, three, four years down the road. So that's a huge benefit uh, for our partners. People need a place to live in, uh, in an apartment through good times and in bad. And um, whereas other sectors like retail or office buildings, if you go through a bad recession, those assets can really be devastated. Apartments usually not as, as severely. The demographics have shifted dramatically over the last 15 years. Uh, the number of echo boomers, millennials have helped drive demand. Home ownership has also dropped about four or five percent the last 15 years. So for each one percent drop in home ownership equates to about a million additional renters. So somewhere between four and five million additional renters out there in the, in the marketplace helping to absorb all the new supply of apartments. So, um, so I think it's a great sector. And it's a preferred asset class for most institutional and private investors. Um, industrial is also very popular. Retail can be riskier, office can be riskier. So for all those reasons, we th multifamily I think is, is one of the, the best sectors uh, to be in if, if you get a choice. All right, so who invests in apartments? I mentioned earlier, Controvest has been blessed. We've had many awesome joint venture partners. Whoops. Uh, private investors. We've had many family offices that will go out and raise $50, $100 million fund from mom and pop investors or maybe some wealthy uh, family members or investors. And they'll then look for assets to either acquire or a de development to partner in. So we've been approached, or we've, partnered with many family offices that have decided to invest, you know, 10, 15 million dollars in, in uh, many of our apartment deals. We've also been blessed to have been uh, introduced to some professional athletes uh, who have invested in our deals, and I'll tell a story later about one in particular. And we've also been fortunate, uh, especially after 30 years in this business, we have a reputation and experience level where landowners who have maybe sat on a piece of land for 5, 10, 15 years are looking for a developer to do a joint venture. So we probably have had seven or eight opportunities where somebody knocks on our door and says, I own this piece of dirt on Maine and Maine, and, and I've, you've been recommended and we'd love to contribute the land and maybe cash on top of that to be your partner. So that's super cool when that happens. Uh, we've had many institutional investors that have partnered with us. Uh, insurance companies, we've done business with Northwestern Mutual, Lincoln National, Pacific Life, real estate funds, big uh, investment houses, Citibank, AIG, UBS. Um, we're just uh, doing our second deal with UBS right now in Orlando. And we've also uh, been lucky enough to uh, partner with some REITs over the years as well to build for them and, and joint venture uh, developments. Any questions on, on who we partner with? Yes. So you, you guys just have deal specific investing rather than kind of general fund? Correct. Uh, uh, some of my partners have wanted to set up a fund, but it's very expensive to set it up. It might be a million, million and a half dollar risk money investment. It may take a year or two to you know, make it happen. And if you happen to catch the wrong cycle, you could lose everything. Uh, as I get older, I've, I've gotten more conservative. So we, we stick to, we find a site, we look for a partner, we look for a lender, and, th and that's just how we've done it. And it's, there's benefits to both, but for us, we, we, that's how we do it. Any other questions on, yeah? So, like in Gainesville, they have this kind of requirement in the development code where if they want to start incorporating, they want to retail right, into residential. And you have the continuum going towards downtown when the retail has been empty for quite some time. So like, what's your opinion on local government employees or apartment developers to do retail and how do you handle that? We hate it. And, and we've been very fortunate in that we've never had to put retail in on any of our projects. So either we shied away from those when we knew it was required or we somehow finagled getting out of having to do it. It's usually a loser uh, and, and they usually sit vacant or you, you get somebody that moves in for six months or a year. You, you have to give them six months free rent to move in and then a year later, they, they, uh, 
they, they skip out and yeah. So it's, it's usually a financial disaster. It can work on some projects, um, but thank God we haven't had to, to deal with it. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so targeted metrics. Uh, this is again, all we do is luxury garden surface parked projects. We don't do mid rises, we don't do high rises, we don't do student housing, we don't do tax credit, we don't do assisted living. So this is the kind of, right now, on a, a performer today, this is the metrics that we try to hit. And if we hit all five of these and the numbers work, it, we get a green light and then we'll go out and look for a partner, look for a lender. Um, so return on cost, six and a half to seven and a quarter. Return on equity, eight to 10. Internal rate of return, I, I assume most of you know what internal rate of return is, but that's after you've developed the property, built it, leased it up, and then sold it. If you look back to see what the overall return was, that's the internal rate of return. So in our pro forma, if we can pro forma 15 to 20% range, usually green light, it should work. To, to your investors. Yes, yes, to the investors, well said. Cost per unit. Uh, when I started with Controvest in 1993, the average cost per unit was about 50,000 a unit. So today it's almost quadruple from when I started, which is mind blowing. I mean, you know, you can buy a house for 150, 200,000 in some neighborhoods. So it's gotten really expensive to develop apartments. And the exit cap rate today, it, most of our submarkets cap rates, if we were to sell a property today, are around the 5% range. And we usually build in our pro forma a half a point to a one point increase because we're projecting what's the property going to sell for three, four years down the road. It's an educated guess. Yes? Where does garden stop and new rises start? Um, garden typically, I mean, it's surface park. So if, if there's no parking structure, to me, that's the difference. A mid rise often has a parking structure, wrap, you know, garage. That makes it a mid rise, and I think it's usually five or six stories. Any other questions? All right, so here, here's an example of a, a typical size deal that we would do and the, and the average cost today. 300 units, we do projects between 200 units and 350, and so 300 is about the average. 185,000 a unit, so the all-in cost to build a project with construction costs, land cost, impact fees, A&E, everything, about 55 and a half million, that's a big number. And we can, right now, lenders are comfortable lending about 65% of the project cost for a construction loan. 15, 10, 12, 15 years ago, lenders were lending 75 to 80%. But after the recession hit, a lot of lenders learned a valuable lesson. Uh, they had to foreclose on a bunch of properties and they said, we're not lending 75% anymore. We want a lot more equity in the deal to make our loans safer. So 65 is the sweet spot. Some lenders are comfortable at 60. You can maybe squeeze 70 out of some lenders if, if the sponsor is rock solid and, the, and it's in a great, property is in a great location. Question. Yeah. Is that, is that based on what you're building? Like, does it depend on the deal that you're doing? Or is yeah. 65 just general? No, 65 is the rule of thumb. Every, every project's unique. And so when you go out to the lending community, um, uh, each lender has different constraints and underwriting, and so you never know exactly what they're comfortable with, but 65 is the rule of thumb from all the lenders that I know for, again, garden properties. Um, and then on the construction loan, uh, I'll share with you what I do. Uh, I secure all the construction loan financing for all our projects, and just like when you go to sell a property, you want to create competition. So when you hire a broker, he's going to go out to 500 or 1,000 potential buyers, hopefully to create competition where everyone's bidding against each other to, to win the day. I do the same thing when I go out for construction loan lenders. I go out to five or six lenders. I ask them to submit a term sheet with like 20 different bullet points. I get the term sheets in. I do a big Excel spreadsheet, and I weight all the different terms I give a, a different weighting and a point system to their proposal. I then add up all the points and the top two or three lenders that have the, the highest point total. I then call them back and say, hey, you made it through the first round. 
you have an opportunity to now to present the, your final and best offer, and these are my hot buttons. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell them, like, interest rate, commitment fee, or whatever it might be. And then a few days later, they submit an updated term sheet with better terms. And then I update my Excel spreadsheet, and usually there's one lender that has the most points. And I call that lender back, and I say, it's a really tight horse race. It's between you and, and the other, another lender. If you can lower your rate another five basis points and, and change this, it's yours. And they, and they always do. So <laughs> I feel like I have a fiduciary responsibility to secure the best construction loan terms that I can find for our joint venture partner and for ourselves. If I can shave off 25 basis points, 50 basis points on the on interest rate, that may tra translate into a savings of a half a million dollars in interest carry over three or four years. And oftentimes, our company shares in that. So I have a selfish motivation, but I also want to make sure our partner gets the best return they can get. Um, let's see what else I'm going to say about that. Oh, also, many developers, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but a lot of them are lazy, and they have one lender that they like to give all their business to because it's easy. Um, one set of loan documents, they can just call their buddy up and he gets some terms, and I guarantee you that they're not getting the most competitive rate because they're not creating competition. So, so that's, that's my little angle that I use. Um, just a, a sample deal. In this sample example, 6.94%, that would meet the threshold for six and a half, seven and a quarter, so check the block. Return on equity. 8.5, that's between the 8 and the 10, th that would work. And the residual value, the projected value, three, four years down the road, if that NOI is real and that cap rate comes into play, the exit price would be 70 million. So if you can create a $14 million spread between the cost of the project and what you can sell it for, it's probably going to be a high teen, 20% IRR. And so if this were real pro forma, it would pass all the metrics, and we would then go out and try to find a partner. A any questions on any of this? Oh, I forgot to share one other thing. On the equity component, if we get a 65% loan, we obviously then need to find 35% equity. And most joint venture partners want the developer to have skin in the game. So they want us to invest between 5 and 10% of the equity because they think that we're going to work harder if we have our cash on the line. We're going to work just as hard, but we, we do it because they, they demand it. So in this example, Contravest would have to put in between a million or $2 million on this deal, and then the joint venture partner would have to come up with $17, $18 million roughly. We do have some partners that only want to put in half of the required equity. So in this example, they might want to put in 8 or $9 million. So then we have to find another partner who's comfortable doing a half a deal. And it makes it a little more cumbersome because your operating agreement, um, you now have three groups, Contravest and two other partners that have to be compatible, agree to all the terms of, of that development. So it's workable. We've done it many times, but it definitely makes it a little more cumbersome. Sure. Yeah. So net operating income is measured as stabilization. Uh, and how long uh, yeah. is that in a typical project? Uh, typical project nowadays is taking two years to build and six months thereafter we would be stabilized. And uh, lenders don't like you to trend your rents in the pro forma, so they want the pro forma to be real live rents at the time they're underwriting the deal. You can, you can stretch it a little bit because it's not a, a perfect science, but any other questions? All right. Um, I'm sure you all know how capitalization works. You know, what is an income stream worth? And I'm going to show you some examples that may be a little shocking to you. All right, so to come up with the value of a property, you take the NOI divided by a cap rate. And in this first example, 3.5 million NOI, six and a quarter cap rate, <clears throat> the value is 56 million. If cap rates happen to drop, to five and three quarters, the same NOI, you've just created almost $5 million of additional value. If the cap rate drops 
to five and a quarter, you've now created $10.7 million of additional value. And if you really get lucky and cap rates and interest rates drop for, to four and three quarters, you've done nothing different with the NOI, but the cap rates, if interest rates move in the middle of a project to your advantage, you can get a huge windfall when you go to exit. So, I mean, that's $17.7 million of potential increase in value bec only because interest rates drop. We have, whoops. Let's see, I, I haven't used this point. Okay, here we go. We have started, let's go, oh, there we go. We have done uh, a handful, maybe five or 10 projects. We're going in, we thought the, cap, the exit cap rate was gonna be about six and a quarter. And from the time we conceptualized the deal, it takes about a year to break ground, two years to build, six months to a year to lease up, and then six months or a year to sell. So in that three and a half to five year period, we have seen cap rates drop uh, and interest rates fall a point, point and a half. And we've been the beneficiary of a huge windfall just because the economy was booming. Nothing that we did, we were just in the right place at the right time. Conversely, Right now, cap rates are in the low range, you know, four and three quarter, five percent range today. So we're performing five and a half, maybe six percent cap rates in our pro forma. If when we go to sell those properties down the road, cap rates are six and a quarter or six and a half, we might find that the value at that time that we thought we were going to exit isn't there, and we may be forced to hold the property longer until interest rates and the cap rates change. So there's a lot of luck involved in cap rate movement, interest rate movement, and uh, nobody knows for sure how the economy is going to play out. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get screwed. Any questions on any of that? Oops. All right, this is pretty simple. I assume you've talked about this in classes, but um, what is a dollar worth assuming a 5% cap rate? And the inverse of a 5% cap rate is a 20 multiple. So that means that if you can increase NOI by $1, you've just created $20 of additional uh, property value. Conversely, uh, if you can increase NOI by 100,000 over a one or two year period on a property by pushing rents aggressively, uh, managing operating expenses, coming up with ancillary additional income that you can pass through to residents. If you, you can increase the value by $2 million. So not only are you producing additional cash flow for your investors, but you're adding, increasing the value of the property. And we try to educate our management senior folks as well as our on-site management staff so they understand how important every dollar is, um, pushing rents, being creative, managing expenses. And um, so we, we, we make sure that they understand how important every dollar is. Any questions on that little simple example? All right, now I'm going to sh uh, share some real life stories about what a economic downturn, a recession can do to a real estate company and, and as well as apartments that are un underway or, or just leasing up. Having been in this business for 42 years, I've been through four, I think, real estate recessions or uh, uh, economic recessions, real estate recessions. And the worst one by a factor of 10 was 2008 through 2011. Most of you guys were probably in high school or middle school and you might have been oblivious to it. I'm sure your parents um, felt it. How, anybody really understand how bad it was? Because I'm about to share you some of the stats. Uh, what, what's your knowledge of? My dad did a supervisor and he did not work for like three years, so. Okay. Anybody else have family members or understood what was going on? Yeah, I just know like, people attempted suicide. It's like a really difficult situation. Anybody else? Well, 2008 through, two, uh, first let me remind you what happened. The stock market dropped 54% in like in a one year period. It literally uh, eliminated trillions of dollars worth of people's net worths all over the country. So people were freaking out. Their 401ks dropped in half. And everybody, I mean, it was very, very dark. It was almost as bad as the 1929 depression. I mean, pretty darn close. 
Um, number two, the unemployment rate went from 5% to 10%. 800,000 to a million people per month were losing their jobs. Um, so, it, I mean, it was really scary, really dark. And the impact it had to Contravest is for four years, we, we went without a new development and without breaking ground a new construction. And, and income fees that we earn by developing and building projects keeps all of our employees employed and the lights on in our office. So we went four years without any income there. And we were just, we had like 12 apartments that we were managing, so the management fee income was the only thing that was keeping the lights on. Yeah? What does your uh, development team do during that time? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna share the rest of the story, but essentially uh, we had to cut to the bone we had 70 people in our construction company right as the recession was starting, and we went from 70 construction employees to one. We kept an estimator on board to just in case we had to run numbers on a new opportunity. We had to terminate a lot of employees. We reduced employees from full-time to part-time. Myself and my partners took 90% pay cuts. We were essentially were making minimum wage just to get insurance to keep our company afloat and alive because uh, we knew we had to do whatever we, we could do to keep the company afloat. We just, we didn't know when the recession was going to end, but we had to be, that's one thing about a, a recession and a downturn, it forces you to, to be laser focused, think outside the box, be creative because you're in survival mode. And um, when the sun's shining and all boats are being raised, you can make mistakes and it's easy, but when you're in a, in a and you're all gonna go work through down cycles, you're gonna see it makes you laser focused, especially when your job's at risk. You, you better be creative, thinking outside the box and be a value add. So uh, anyway, I think we might have let one of our development people go, I can't remember exactly, but we cut to the bone and reduced benefits. Um, we moved from an A-class office space to a C-plus um, sublet space to save 60% on our rent. I mean, I literally scrutinized every expense on our financial statement to figure out where, where could I cut, what could we do to survive because, um, you know, it, it, was, it was scary. So that gives you a little overview of the impact to our company, what happened. I mean, it was, it was devastating. Now I'm going to share with you what happened with our eight properties that had just finished construction were in lease up. Um, and they were in like three or four different states. So we're in lease up, and the recession hits, and oh my God, immediately residents would start uh, skipping out. And so our occupancy dropped 10, 20% because if people lose their job, you know, they want to go home to mom and dad. So our occupancy dropped dramatically. And the only way we could rent any new apartments was to offer concessions. And we had to give two, three, and up to four months free rent to get people to, to move into our property. And you, you know, four months free rent is 33% reduction on your, your rent. You think about that. Two months would be the 17%. So if you, if you truncate your income by 17 to 33%, just think how horrific your NOI looks. So, so now, when I secured construction loans for each of the eight properties, I get a three-year interest-only period. And the three-year interest-only period for all eight of these properties was coming due in 2009. So I, I, that, you have the option after three-year interest-only construction loan to pull a one, two, or three-year extension with your lender, a loan extension but you have to qualify for it. You have to pay a fee and you have to qualify uh, debt service coverage. So since I'm responsible for the financing, I ran some quick analysis with the reduced NOI that was in place at all our properties. And I ran my debt service coverage test. I realized that not only did we not meet the debt service coverage hurdle, we were like 20, 30% below it. And and I knew within a year we were going to be technically in default on our whole loan portfolio, over $200 million, that I had signed personally and as did my partners. So on top of a 90% salary reduction, um, 
cutting to the bone, no income coming in except for management fees. Our properties were upside down, and I realized that I had to pull a rabbit out of the hat to figure out how I was going to get our lenders to work with us to give us more time. And this is where my five years worth of real estate workout experience, which wasn't by design, I just fell into that. I knew what it was like to work for the FDIC and the FSLIC and how to negotiate with developers. And so I knew all the right things to say to all my lenders. So one by one, I got on the phone with every lender and I convinced them that it was in their best interest and our best interest to figure out how we could move forward together to not find us technically in default and foreclose and take our properties. Um, and if we lost one property, the pyramids, it would be like a game of dominoes. If, if we lose one, we're going to lose them all. So I had to keep all eight deals alive. So one by one, I, I got through to every lender, and they were willing to work with us if I could convince my partners, uh, um, our equity partner, to put money in the deal and to pay down the debt, and if I could convince my contravest partners to put cash in the deal to pay down the debt. So over the next year, uh, my t number one mission was to save all eight properties and keep everything alive and buy more time to get through the recession. And one by one, I worked through it. I got our partners the right checks. I got my controversial partners the right checks. And we got through this horrific dark hole. And, and as I look back at my 42-year career, I've, I've had a lot of successes, hit Grand Slam home runs, made a lot of money. But the most rewarding period of my 42 years was working through this recession because uh, it, it took everything I had to use all my skills to um, quarterback um, working through that. So I, as I am at the twilight of my career, that's the thing I'm the most proud of. Um, so just keep in mind, as you guys work through recessions, uh, it's a chance to really grow and learn. And um, as I said, when the Economy's booming and things are easy. Everybody can make money and everyone looks good, but it's, you really can show your worth in tough times. So just keep that in mind uh, as you go through your career. Yeah. How have you made controversial recession proof? Number one, uh, it can never be fully recession proof because if the economy, if we have another recession that's devastating, you can't get development deals done, you can't get construction loan financing, and that's a given. But number one, lenders are now requiring us to put 35% equity in the deal instead of 20 or 25%. So that really protects us because it would really have to be an ugly scenario to wipe out 35% of real equity. So that's, and we're, we have the management company which helps in a recession because you at least have that to bring some fees in. But the bottom line is you just try to do solid deals in good sub-markets that make sense, that will, can weather a recession. And you want to make sure you have good joint venture partners that if, if the crap hits the fan, that they're going to be there to put more money in the deal to buy more time. Because there, there could be some joint venture partners that say, I'm not putting another dollar. I don't care. You know, you're on your own. Um, but so you want to make sure you know your partners and that they're willing to be there through good times and bad. I mean, we literally looked at every single expense uh, on the income statement and thought about, all right, what can we, where can we cut? I mean, just, I mean, the, every dollar was precious because that was one less dollar that my partners and I, we were cutting, not only was our salary down to minimum wage, 90% pay cut, but we were cutting checks to lenders and we were cutting checks to keep our company afloat and to keep the key people that we didn't want to lose. And I forgot to mention this. When the recession hit, before I talked to our lenders, my, part, my controversial partners, we went to a bankruptcy attorney just to understand, was that something that we might have to consider? And uh, thank God we didn't have to go there, but we wanted to be prepared to see if that was a, a valid option. Yeah. Rents started to grow, concessions started to uh, fall. All of a sudden, you saw some new development taking place. 
lenders would start calling saying they're back in business. Our joint venture partners would say, hey, you know, we're, things are improving, stock market's going up. Uh, the government was dropping interest rates severely to try to stimulate the economy. So uh, there was a lot of positive changes that took place that made it, made it easier to start getting back into the development world. Anybody? Okay, all right. How am I doing on time, by the way? Well, are we about 20 minutes or so? Yeah. All right. Um, this is a long story, but I'm going to make the short version of it. We were going to develop a 450-unit apartment project in West Palm Beach right on 95. It had 600 feet of frontage, and it, it was on environmentally, uh, environmental issue property. It was an abandoned golf course. It had contaminated water. It was going to be really a nightmare. Well, a few months before we were going to go forward with the development with a new partner, a broker called us and said, hey, I've got a condo uh, developer who wants your land. You can make a quick million and a half, $2 million profit and no risk, no development risk, no construction risk, no environmental risk. And we got all excited and said, wow, that's pretty sweet. So we switched gears and decided we were going to flip the land and make a nice profit with no joint venture partner, which meant Contravis got to enjoy that full profit. So right be close to before they were ready to go hard on the land flip, the buyer changed his mind, and now we're like a month away from either closing on the land or walking from the land and just walking away from our deposit money, et cetera. So we had a decision to make. Do we take the risk and close on the land, get a land loan, and then try to flip it, or do we walk away from it and lose half a million dollars or whatever it was? So the broker convinced us that this was a valuable piece of land right on I-95, and we couldn't lose. So we got a land loan for like $5.8 million, and we bought the land for $6.5 million. First time in our history that we've ever bought a piece of land with the strategy to flip it. So we had it on the market. We had a bunch of buyers that would sign a contract, and they bailed out because they got spooked by environmental, blah, blah, blah. Finally, in 2005, this will blow, blow your mind, we found a condo, a national condo developer who was a multi-billion dollar company, and they, at this point, we, our basis in the land was about $8 million. They signed a contract to purchase our property for $18.5 million. They went hard on a $200,000 deposit, and we literally were less than a month away from closing. We were going to clear a $10 million profit on a, on a land flip. It would have been the biggest gain in the history of our company by a factor of five, and we didn't have to share it with a joint venture partner. So needless to say, I'm fantasizing about all this money coming. I, was, I made the mistake of I went to a Maserati dealership, and I was thinking about what color Maserati I was going to buy. I jinxed the whole deal. So. The next week, the buyer called up and said, I am so sorry, we've overextended and we've tied up too many pieces of land all over the country and we're gonna drop your site. We were devastated. So they walked away from a $200,000 deposit, which helped a little, but we wanted to close. So the next couple of years, we had it under contract two or three more times and then the recession hit. To make a long story short, in the middle of the recession, when we weren't earning any fees, our company was devastated. We couldn't carry the land anymore. Uh, it was costing us $500,000 a year to carry the land loan and the real estate taxes. And we finally were running out of resources. We said, we have to sell it. We don't care what we sell it for. We have to stop the bleeding. Our land basis at this time was now $11 million because we had $4.5 million worth of land carry. So we bought it for $6.5 million. We now have $11 million in it with all the land carry and the real estate taxes. And we sold the piece of land for $3.1 million. So we went from almost making a $10 million profit on a land split to losing $8 million. The most devastating loss in our company's history by a mile. And a huge lesson learned. We will never land bank again. It, it can work for some groups, but if you get caught in the recession and you have big carry costs, it can eat you alive. So 
Uh, that might be a world's record for the biggest swing from gain to loss on one piece of land. And eventually somebody built an apartment project on it and you know, every time I pass by it, I'm depressed. But <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this one. All right, um, yeah, so I'm running out of time, I can't tell all the stories. All right, this is another interesting story. Um, Two-phase apartment project in Brandon that we built, 455 units right across the street from each other with the same Jordan Venture partner. And we got through, we finished construction in the middle of the recession, the lease up, we got through it, we put permanent financing on our projects, we bought more time, and then finally, 2012 and 13, the economy is improving, NOI is growing, rents are growing, and we realized, God, we, we weathered a storm, and we had seven-year permanent loan financing on the property that was going to get us through 2018. Our joint venture partner called me and said in 2013, we know this is not the right time to sell the property, um, but we want to redeploy our capital and we want you to put the property on the market and sell now. And I, myself and my partners begged them not to do that because the NOI was growing and if we just had another couple of years we were gonna make a lot of money. He who has the gold makes the rules and the one who puts all the equity in makes the final decision on when, when's the right time to sell. They forced us to sell the property and we sold both phases in 2013, way too early. And at the sale, our partner barely got their equity back. No preferred return, Contravis got zero out of it. We were so pissed. And not only did we get zero out of the sale, we lost the management income on two properties, like $200,000 worth a year income. So it really stung. So now for the rest of the story. The company that bought that two-phase property two years later in, in 2015 put the property on the market and they sold it for $22 million more than they paid us. So our partner and controversy, we, $22 million would have been ours if, we, if our partner had just been a little more patient. And we wanted to rub that in their faces, but we couldn't, because we've done 22 joint ventures with this group, and uh, they, they know they messed up. And uh, so moral of the story is, make sure your, your partner and, your, and, and yourself is aligned with when to exit. And again, they, he who has the gold makes the rules, so we got screwed on that big time. Uh, so the other thing is stick to your knitting. If you decide to venture off and do something, some other development, and we got involved in the condo project and lost millions, just be careful. Make sure you understand the risks. Land banking's dangerous, so we've learned a lot of valuable lessons. All right, here's a joint venture uh, decision dilemma, that a real-time situation that happened about five years ago. Um, we found a new joint venture partner, family office from Canada. They were going to partner with us on a 244-unit project in Maitland, Central Florida. And 30 days before closing, our construction department came with us with catastrophic news. The construction budget number that we had was short by $2.8 million, a 15% budget blow, the biggest blow in the history of our company. We've also oftentimes been short on the construction number, but not like this. Absolutely devastating. At this point in time, Contravest had advanced $600,000 in land deposits, architect engineering, et cetera. So my question for the audience and to see who's brave enough, anybody have any ideas or potential options you could think of if you were handed this, this set of facts, what would you do? And anybody want to throw out some ideas? There's no wrong answer. We had, we had set the construction budget probably nine months before we were ready to break ground without a set of plans. It's just an educated guess by our construction department based on historical data. And the hard thing to predict is how busy all the subs are gonna be when you get ready to break ground. And if all the subcontractors are busy, they submit bids and the only way they're gonna do your job is if they add a 20% markup. So all the bids came in from, you know, we get two or three bids every single line item and they tallied it all up, and we're a $2.8 million blow. So it, it, just, it just happens sometimes. That's the hardest part of the business because no one has a crystal ball to know what the numbers are gonna be. Yeah. Yeah, development fees, right, correct? Yes. I mean, I, I don't know, you could reduce your equity stake off of that, or why, I guess you have some place. 
Okay. Any other ideas of what we could possibly do? Okay, well, I'm going to show you, uh, well, before I show you, well, the first thing we did is we contacted the land seller to say, hey, this deal is going to create or we have a huge construction overrun. If you can't help us out and reduce the land price, we're walking. So thank God the land seller was a little flexible and helped us out. I approached our lender and I said, we're upside down. We need you to help. Can you stretch and give us a bigger loan? Because debt is, is much cheaper than equity. Uh, you, know, you can finance a project, let's say, 4 or 5% interest rate. Equity might cost you 10 11%. So debt's cheaper. Um, and you can scrub all the line items in the budget and see if there's any fat anywhere you can trim. The other thing you can do is value engineering. Does anybody know what that term is? Anybody know what value engineer is? What do you think it is? Exactly. Uh, so for example, if you had a tile roof, you could switch that out to dimensional shingle and maybe save 300000 You could. There's a, a lot of things you can do inside the buildings that no resident would see that you could save money. Unfortunately, we had already done a lot of that, so there really wasn't anywhere else. Plus, a lot of part, joint venture partners don't want to change the specification or the scope. They don't want to cheapen the product and help us out oftentimes because they think you might get lower rents. So it's a battle with your partner. So this is what the original pro forma looked like in May 2013. And um, the projected return on cost was 7.4, and the return on equity was over 11. And our partner, a Canadian partner, brand new first time partner, potential partner, they were going to earn a 10% preferred return compounded monthly, which is about 11%. And the waterfall structure, 70-30, uh, after the 11% PREF is paid, any excess dollars get split 70, 70, whoops. Oh. Sorry. All right, so that's the waterfall structure. Any questions on the waterfall structure, how that works? Okay. So, this is how our joint venture partner, who we'd never done business with for, from Canada, Canada, they basically, we told them where we could save a few dollars, and then they, they told us this is what we had to accept or they're walking, because they had already raised the money from a group of investors, and they, they couldn't go back and change the deal, so they, they were going to cram us down. So this is, this is what they came back at. Our land seller lowered the land price by 330000 That helped. $2.8 million construction cost overrun. Our partner, our potential partner said, Controvest, we want you to cut your fees in half and take a $900,000 haircut, which is huge. We've never had to do that ever. And a few other, oh, and then the biggest, thank God, the lender was willing to increase their loan by $2 million. So that absorbed a lot of the cost overruns. So on the revised pro forma that our lender said we had to accept or they're walking, their yield the returns dropped a little bit, but not materially. But they said to us, the only way we're going to go forward is in addition to you taking a 50% cut in your fees, that you would have to pay a 20% effective preferred return. And you might not understand what that does to the developer, but essentially that dramatically eliminates the chance for us to see any upside when we sell the property. Unless you hit a triple or a home run, you're not going to see any upside. So they're asking us to cut our fee in half and basically maybe not earn anything when we sell the property. So my question for you in the audience, how many people raise your hand? If you were the developer, would you walk from the deal or would you have accepted this? How many people would have walked from the deal? All right, so the balance of you, I guess you would accept it. All right, well, my controversy partner, Mark, um, he was the quarterback on this deal. He was so incensed that this brand new Canadian partner was ramming it down our throat and he thought they were punitive and taking advantage of the situation. He was so ticked that he wanted to walk from the deal. Remember, we had advanced $600,000 worth of pre-development cost. So if we had walked from the deal, we lost $600,000. So I had to convince my controversy partner, Mark, we have to do this deal. If we close, we get $600,000 back, so we're already ahead of the game. 
we will still earn $900,000 in fees, half of what we should have, but still it's fees coming in. And I said, you know, we might not make any money when we sell, but you just never know. And so I convinced my partner to bite his lip and, and go forward. So we went forward and closed. And this is how the deal played out. Whoops. Okay, we broke ground in late 2013. Every construction nightmare that could happen, happened. We had a sinkhole on the, on the property that we found early on. We had to pour $300,000 of cement in the ground to stabilize the foundation under the building. We had to put up a 25-foot retaining wall in the back of the property by the lake. We had the framer blow out, which is the worst sub that you ever want to have blow out. And when you have a, a, a sub blows out, you have to find a replacement. You lose time. You lose money. Friggin' nightmare. Inspection, ex, inspector, city inspectors were a friggin' nightmare. A couple of our construction folks quit because it was a horrible job. Uh, and normally, uh, we had budgeted, I think, 17 months to build the property. It took 27 months to build. And time is money in almost everything in life. So if it takes an extra 10 months to build, you know you're losing money on the construction contract. Plus, you're losing net rental cash flow because the buildings aren't coming online when you thought. So it's a devastating scenario. Through the entire construction, we're thinking, why did we go forward with this? It probably was better not to have done the deal. We finally finished. We stabilized. We leased up the property five months later. And then in early 2017, I hired a broker, and we put the property on the market. And this is how it played out. We built it for $32 million. We sold it for $44 million. So we created $12 million of value. Our partner put in $7.5 million. They got back $17 million. We put in $500,000 and got back $4 million. So even though we thought it was the worst deal in the world and we almost walked from it and we got half of our development fee cut, we ended up hitting a triple. And um, overall IRR is 32%. Our partner's return was over 26%. So it, it worked out, but it was a friggin' nightmare. I aged 10 years, my partner's aged 10 years. But we got lucky because of falling interest rates, falling cap rates, booming economy, stock market was up, trees were going to the sky, and we just, we ended up in the right place at the right time. Any, any questions on this scenario? All right. This is what this property looked like. It was actually a, a brand new contemporary uh, design by our architect, and I think it looks super cool. And, and two or three of you, I think, have seen this project. I, I took you out to see it. All right, now, a, a quick story. On a pro one of my partners found a site in late 2000, in 2004 in Glendale, Arizona. And does anyone know what happens in Glendale, Arizona every year coming up uh, once a year? Wasteland. What? Wasteland. A national football championship, football game, and college football. <laughs> but you're right, there is, I think, there, waste management, that could be uh, the golf tournament, right? Yeah, that's the golf tournament. Okay, all right, cool. All right. So, we found a site about a mile from where they were going to build a brand new football state. I mean, the yeah, football stadium for the national championship football arena. And at the same time that we found this site, we had been uh, dancing with and courting a professional athlete that we got introduced to. And over a year and a half period, he came to our office three or four times. A very smart athlete. He wanted to learn about real estate. He wanted to invest in real estate, but he first had to understand it, and then uh, we had to gain his trust. So after a year and a half of courting him, uh, he finally said, I'm all in. And he committed to be our partner on this. So about a month and a half before closing, I had the construction loan pulled in. Everything was ready to roll. And one of my ContraVest partners gets a phone call from a Phoenix uh, broker that says, I'm working with a bunch of Microsoft executives who have banded together and they're buying existing apartments all over Phoenix and they want to know if we're interested in doing a pre-sale with them. Does anybody know what a pre-sale arrangement is? Anybody want to take a guess? Sell before it's built. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, um, so my controversy partner said, are we open to that? And I said, hey, Let's find out what they're, what they're thinking, and who knows? We've never done it before, but we may be open to it. So we got in touch with the, the potential buying group. We, we told them, make an offer, and let's get the ball started. 
So they throw out a number and they said that we'd be willing to put $2 million hard deposit up day one before we break ground and they would commit to buy it no later than 90 days after final CO with no occupancy contingency, uh, no contingency at all. The only way they could back out of the deal is if we never delivered the project. So we negotiated the purchase price back and forth, cut the deal, they put $2 million hard deposit on before we broke ground. Never happened in our history and, and probably will never happen again. So, this is, and this is with our professional athlete, his first deal with us. And this is how the deal played out. We, we built it for $30.7 million. We sold it for $41 million. And the IRR was 49%, and the multiple was over two. So in two years, from groundbreak to sale, our partner doubled his money, uh, and we made an $11 million profit with essentially no risk, no occupancy hurdle. And I went to the coolest closing dinner I've been at in my life <laughs> with this professional athlete, his wife, who's a Grammy Award winner singing, singer, and it was a special evening. So that was a one in a million type scenario. All right, uh, one other su successful case study. One of my partners, oh, by the way, let me, oh, let me, oh, I forgot to point this out. This is very important. Take a look at the date that we sold the property. We sold this pre-sale in September 2007, literally months before the, the recession, the major crash. If we hadn't done this, we probably <laughs> would have, it would have been a completely different scenario. Who knows how it would have played out, but we literally, by the whisker, we, we sold it before the crash. Who was the professional athlete? I could tell you, but I'd have to shoot you, but I'll tell you, but please don't, <laughs> please don't call him up and say, hey, I heard that you did a deal with controversy. Grant Hill, uh, NBA, uh, first class athlete, smart guy, uh, just awesome, 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 awesome. All right. All right, so 2012, we find, this is just after the recession ended, and one of my partners at Controverse finds a site in Charlotte, and um, we go out to the 10 joint venture partners we've done business with. Everybody's not interested. The everyone's still licking their wounds after this horrific recession. They're not ready to jump back in and do a deal. Um, so then we reach out to another 20 groups that we that they knew us, we knew them, and everybody passed. Everybody was still real tentative, didn't want to jump back in and do a development deal. And so my controversial partner, Mark, said, John, I think we need to go hard on the land here. Normally, we never go hard on a piece of land until we know we have it financed by a partner. He said, this is a great site. I believe in it. I think we need to take a risk and, and go hard on the land. And, and we're going to find a partner. I know we will. So we collectively decided to take additional risk to buy some time. So we go hard on a piece of land, which means we have more money at risk. And we go out to another 10 groups. And we strike out. And now we're like, oh, my God, this, we can't find anybody willing to do this deal. We hire a national broker, Cushman and Wakefield, and they go out to 100 potential joint venture partners all over the country. 10 or 15 come in to see the site. We meet with them. Every single one passed, and now we're running out of time, and we're like, oh, my God, I cannot believe we can't get this deal financed. And then a group from Virginia, a private family office group that had just raised $100 million, met us at the property, saw the site, drove the submarket, met with us, did some due diligence on us, and after about a week, they said, we're in. And we're like, thank you, God. So 70 groups passed on the property, 20 of them which even went to the, and visited the site, and 20 of them passed. And this is how it played out. We built, whoa, sh what did I just do? <laughs> oh, you just missed the punchline. Where's tech, technical help, help? It'll come back. Oh, it'll come back? It's the uh, return, right? Back button. Back button. Okay, all right. We, we built it for $32 million. We sold it for $49 million. So we created about seven, uh, what, $17 million worth of value. IRR, 59%. Multiple, triple. 
the, the most successful deal in the history of our, con uh, our company, highest IRR, highest multiple, and 70 professional joint venture partners passed on it. So we were this close to not hitting it out of the park. Mind blowing. <laughs> all right, I, all right I, I'm gonna skip this one. And uh, just in closing, Real estate is an awesome career choice, and for all of you that have chosen that, there's a lot of twists and turns, a lot of ups and downs, but my 42 years, I wouldn't have traded for anything in the world. It's been an amazing ride. Um, incredible real estate benefits with the cash flow that's sheltered by depreciation, coupled with property appreciation, which is huge. Multifamily is a great stable asset class, and as I said before, you're going to go through bad times, and you're going to learn more in those bad times than you are in good times when it's easy. So I want to thank everybody for their participation, and most importantly, go Gators.